Well, here we are. It's time for us to come back together. And we anticipate that on coming this Sunday, June the 7th. And so what we want to do today is we want to show you some of the things that we're trying to do so that we can follow the guidelines of the CDC and let you know we're trying to do everything we can to be as respectful uh, of others and of space, of distance between one another. But we are so excited that we have this opportunity to come back together. So let's come on in and we have some folks to help us to show us some of the things to do and not do come this Sunday, June 7th. What you'll notice when you come in the door, you'll see uh, Sprouts a package for the young kids and you'll see communion packets for, uh, for each family. We want everyone to pick that up um, for your family, however many you have in your family. What we also want you to be mindful of is being respectful of uh, everyone's distance and want you to exit in, at, to the doors closest to your section of the auditorium. We also want you to know that as you exit the auditorium, there will be garbage cans at all the exit doors uh, so that you can put your communion in the trash can and dispose of it properly. You will also notice at each uh, exit uh, here in the main lobby, you'll see the box uh, the, for your offering. Uh, there will also be boxes or buckets or some uh, item like that so you can put your offering in as you exit those parts of the auditorium as well. We also want to encourage you to be respectful of each other's social distancing boundaries. So now we move to our section of the video tonight, and I want to introduce our summer series. Because we are not able to meet here on Wednesday evenings yet, we're having our speakers to give us a video. We're still going to have the theme of transformation. And what we'll have each speaker do is talk about the transformation of characters of Scripture from one point in their life to another and how God transformed them through those events and because of their faith. Tonight we have Philip Jenkins. Philip is the youth minister at the Mount Juliet Church of Christ, but has spent some time here uh, at Savannah as a youth minister as well. Philip's going to be talking to us about the transformation of Hannah from barren to blessed. So I know that you'll be encouraged by this lesson and want to encourage you to stay with us, stay with Philip uh, throughout his lesson tonight. And we thank you for joining us. And we hope that this video has been educational and helpful for you as we seek to come back together this Sunday, June the 7th. Now we have Philip Jenkins on the transformation of Hannah. Hello, Savannah congregation. I hate that I couldn't be with you tonight, uh, but it is, it's good to almost see you guys this evening. Every year I look forward to being with you when we gather together for Evangelism University, uh, but even then we have those EU conversations that are not very long usually, and I was looking forward to having more of those conversations with you guys and continuing uh, just to catch up. I hope everybody's doing well. Can you believe it's been 10 years since Laura and I left Savannah. Uh, we left in 2010 and uh, life has just continued to march on and, and time does that, I suppose. But when I think about our time in Savannah, uh, I have so many great memories. I think about the apartment that we had uh, that was on the backside of Uptown. May Uptown rest in peace. I know you guys probably miss Uptown. Uh, I think about the, the shower that you guys threw for us uh, when we bought a home there in Savannah. I think about camp that we had uh, when we had Hardin County Bible Camp at Short Mountain, and uh, a lot of memories, great memories there, and some really funny memories. Uh, great memories of a mission trip to Honduras, the first one I ever planned, and uh, got to, to go with you guys. That all took place in about two years' time, 
And uh, that doesn't even cover half of everything that happened. And so I really do look back on our time uh, filled with a lot of great memories, and I've learned so much from you. And I truly am grateful for that time. Is there something that you've always wanted to have, but you can never quite get it? Think about that for a minute. Is there something that you've always wanted, but you were never able to have? I guess as a kid, I would have answered that question by thinking about a chinchilla, the pet that I always wanted, but for some reason Santa would never bring me. When you think about it, in The Wizard of Oz, you got three characters that all wanted something. The tin man who wanted that heart, the scarecrow who wanted the brain, the lion, the cowardly lion who wanted courage. Is there something you've always wanted that you've never been able to have? Some of you hear that and you immediately think about a possession, like a certain kind of car, you've got it picked out. Uh, some of you might think about, man, I wish I had a private jet. Others of you think, man, I wish I had a, a vacation home on the beach in Destin. I don't know. I don't know how you answer that question, but is there something that you've always wanted but you've never been able to have? Others of you would take that question in a completely different way. And maybe some of your answers would be very heartfelt and maybe even some that are bittersweet. Your answer might be a lasting relationship. Someone to fall in love with and spend my life with. Someone I can trust. Others of you might say, one thing I've always wanted but I've never been able to have, I wish I could have a time machine so that I could go back and, and change some things and do things differently. I wish I could have a, a second chance. Or maybe you, you wish you could go back and relive some of the best moments of your life. Is there something you've always wanted but you've never been able to have? Maybe you would say, a mom or a dad who would take care of me. Maybe you would fill in the blank by saying, a child. Is there something you've always wanted but you've never been able to have? Tonight as we study God's Word, we're going to meet someone who I think we could have filled in the blank for when it comes to that question. Her name is Hannah. Let's read in God's Word together. We'll be in 1 Samuel chapter 1. There was a certain man of Ramathim Zophim, of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuth, an Ephrathite. He had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Peninnah his wife and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? Okay, let's recap. Talk a little bit about what's going on here in this passage. There's a man named Elkanah who had two wives, Peninnah and Hannah. Peninnah had sons and daughters, and it seems like she might have had several from the way this passage reads. Hannah, on the other hand, has none. And it's not because Hannah doesn't want to have kids, it's because Hannah's not able to. Even so, Hannah seems to be Elkanah's favorite wife. Hannah gets two birthday presents instead of one. She gets like the double, double slice of cake and two scoops of ice cream versus Peninnah, who only gets one. And maybe that's why Peninnah decides to make Hannah's life miserable. It sounds like jealousy to me. Peninnah is jealous of Hannah. And the Bible uses an interesting word to describe Peninnah's relationship to Hannah. It calls her Hannah's rival. That carries with it this idea of, of an adversary, of an opponent, someone who 
uh, is standing in your way to oppose you. Does it sound like anybody you know? That's exactly the way that the Bible describes what Satan does for us, our adversary. And so in a way, look, look where Peninnah has aligned herself and look who she's aligned herself with. She's playing a role similar to the one that Satan plays with us. Verse 6, her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. You talk about low. You talk about heartless. How cruel can you be? Peninnah did this just for the purpose of irritating her. What a jerk. And by the way, don't you know that Peninnah's kids were just a joy to have in the youth group, right? If they're anything like their parents. Verse 7 sheds a little more light on how this went down. Verse 7, So it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. When did it happen? Year by year. And get this, where did it happen? On her way to worship. I wonder what Peninnah said to Hannah as she was making her way there to worship. Now, the Bible never tells us, but I imagine it must have been some of the most cruel things you could dream up. Hey, Hannah, on your way to worship again, I see. That's interesting slash pathetic how you keep worshiping a God who won't even give you a baby. You know children are a gift from God. I actually scratch that. You don't know. I do. Speaking of which, I wonder why you can't have babies. You must really have some major sin issues, huh? Like, what did you do for God to hate you so much? You know, it's your fault, right? Why you can't have babies? Oh, and FYI, I saw that double portion that Elkanah gave you, but you and I both know the only reason that he does that is because he feels so sorry for you, right? You're pathetic. You're trash. You'll never be the mother that I am. In fact, you'll never be a mother at all. You're worthless. So go ahead and worship. And hey, maybe if you pray a little harder, God will give me another baby this year instead of you. It was torture. Bullying to the highest or the lowest degree. The things Peninnah said to Hannah were so cruel, Hannah wouldn't even eat. All she could do was cry. And her husband didn't help things either. Verse 8, Oh, Hannah, what are you crying about? Why aren't you eating? Why are you so sad? Am I not worth more to you than ten sons? Sounds like a priceless individual. At least her husband was understanding. I'm sure it made it way better. And so here we go. Picture Hannah, who's been weeping on her way to Shiloh to worship, trying to do her best to hold it together and put on a straight face while her enemy has done nothing but mock her the entire way. Verse 9, after they'd eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. Hannah's distressed and heartbroken and just torn to pieces. But look what she does in her anguish. Look where she takes her grief. She goes directly to the throne of God. What about you? What about me? When we're distressed, when our hearts are broken, when our enemy oppresses us, when we're mistreated, when we feel beaten down, when even our spouse doesn't understand what we're going through, when we feel empty, when we're depressed, and we feel like something is missing, and maybe you can't even eat because you're so miserable, what do you do? Well, we ought to do what Hannah did. She pours out her heart to God. Verse 11, and she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. Is there something you've always wanted but you've never been able to have? Hannah's got her answer, a son. And she's pouring out her heart. And she's pouring out her tears. Lord, I just want to be a mom. 
I just want to have a child. And she's crying out to God, please, Lord, just give me this, give me this, your servant. Oh, but she doesn't stop there. This is a different kind of prayer. She takes a vow. She says, God, if you'll just give me the one thing I've always wanted but I've never been able to have, if you'll just give it to me, Lord, I'll give them back to you. Wow. That's a different kind of prayer. But then again, Hannah's a different kind of person. I know it probably doesn't work this way. But I imagine God seated upon the throne, hearing millions and millions and millions of prayers. And maybe almost like you're you're sorting through the mail. And God takes those petitions and He says, Thank you for this day. Thank you for my family. Please give us good health. Keep us safe. But then He gets to this one. And He sees Hannah's petition. And Hannah's prayer catches the attention of God. And by the way, so does yours. And isn't that an awesome thing? Verse 11, one more time. O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. How would you describe that prayer? Better yet, how would you describe the person who said that prayer? Bold, unselfish, trusting, believing, faithful, servant. In fact, in that one sentence, she confesses her servanthood to the Lord three times. Hannah knew her role. In my prayer life, how often do I use that word to describe my willingness to serve God? After reading this story, I'm going to try to remember to use that word more often in my prayers. Hannah understood she was God's servant. Verse 12, as she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart. Only her lips moved and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, How long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, Shh, I'm trying to pray. That's not what she said. She says, No, my Lord. I'm a woman troubled in spirit. I've drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I've been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant, there's the word again, as a worthless woman. For all along, I've been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. Then Eli answered, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant, again, let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. And if you haven't identified yet with Hannah's story, then surely you identify with the way verse 18 ends. There have been many times where I've eaten food, and my heart has been full, (laughs) and I've been happy again. I'm no longer sad. Hannah must have visited the local Shiloh Krispy Kreme with the hot sign still on or something. Let's finish the story. Verse 19. They rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah, and Elkanah knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. We'll skip down to verse 24. And when she had weaned him, she took him up along with her, uh, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour and a skin of wine. And she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh, and the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull, and they brought the child to Eli. And she said, O my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who is standing here in your presence praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord as long as he lives. He is lent to the Lord. You know, it's one thing to make a promise. It's entirely another thing to keep it. Have you ever said something in in all, maybe a really emotional state that you didn't mean? And later on you're like, well, I was emotional. 
I, I, I wasn't serious. Hannah didn't back down. Hannah didn't waver in keeping her vow before the Lord. You know that had to be a temptation, right? Like, Hannah kept her word. In fact, the Bible says in verse 24 that Samuel was young when Hannah took him back to Shiloh. We don't know how old he was, but the Bible goes out of its way to say he's young. You know that had to be hard. The memories of your kids when they're young, man, those tug at your heart. And you want to play those memories over and over again in your mind. You, uh, you take as many pictures as you can, and you try to write down all the funny stories, and, and you, you watch those videos, you play them over and over again, and you look forward to when Facebook reminds you of them a year later. As a parent, you live for those moments. And you don't, you don't just, you, you want those days, those laughs, those sweet voices, those sweet moments. You don't want those memories to ever fade. And here's Hannah taking her very young child and dropping, dropping him off at the temple to be raised by Eli the priest. And we're not told this in God's Word, but you know what happens when you take a small child to a new place, to a person they don't know very well, and then you leave. Good luck trying to keep that kid from his mama, right? You who work at Love and Learn, that, that's what this is about, right? You know what this is like. Good luck trying to keep the child from his mama. Good luck trying to keep the mama from her child. I don't know if Eli had any toys lying around, but I bet he's, he wished he did if he didn't. And as hard as it would have been for Hannah to take this particular trip to Shiloh to do what she'd vowed to do, I imagine that the trip back home to Ramah would have been way worse. But Hannah didn't waver. A few things as we close. Number one, the greatest thing that I can do for my child is serve God. The greatest thing that I can do for my child is serve God. Hannah was a servant, no doubt about it. You want your child to serve God? You serve God. It's not something you just tell them to do. It's not something you drop them off at the church building and expect them to do. It is something you must do. It is something you must show them. It must be who you are. And that's exactly who Hannah was. And guess who Samuel turned out to be? A mighty servant of God. In fact, do you remember one of the first things we ever hear Samuel say? In 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 10, he's just had a conversation with Eli because he's heard this voice and it's woken him up in the middle of the night. And Samuel says to God, Speak, Lord, for what? Your servant hears. God would go on to use Samuel in mighty ways. Remember, it was Samuel who would be the one to famously anoint the greatest king that Israel would ever have, David, the man after God's own heart. But if you think about it, Hannah had a hand in that, didn't she? Takeaway number two, if the greatest thing that I can do for my child is serve God, then this is also true. The greatest thing my child can do is serve God. The greatest thing my child can do is serve God. I want you to repeat that out loud in just a minute with me because it's one thing for me to say that and to believe that. But it's another thing for you to say this out loud and really think about how powerful this is. You say it with me. The greatest thing that, you, that my child can do is serve God. The greatest thing my child can do is serve God. Verse 28, Hannah says, As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord. Hannah said, God, he's yours. Here he is. I'm giving you my child. As long as he lives, he's yours. What a statement. God, as long as my child lives, he's yours. Hannah understood that the greatest thing her child could do was serve God. Do you believe that? Like, really? Do you really believe that the greatest thing your child can do is serve God? Dad, I've decided that I want to do mission work. 
Dad, I, I've decided that, that I, I want to do youth ministry. Mom, Dad, I, I've decided I, wa- I want to be a preacher. Listen, son, there's no money in that. You're going to struggle. Health insurance is going to be a problem for you all your life. Listen, I'm just looking out for you. I don't mean to discourage you. And, and you know that you can make a great career doing X, Y, Z. Now, wait a minute. I thought the greatest thing your child could do is serve God. Well, he can serve God and sell real estate. Yeah, he can. He can. But why would you ever, ever want to discourage your child from serving God in any way? Because you just did. You made it about money. You made it about a career. You made it about comfort. You made it about insurance. Don't ever, ever discourage a heart of ministry. That word that means servant. A minister is a servant. Don't ever discourage a heart of servanthood in your children. The greatest thing my child can do is serve God. Now listen, that kind of statement challenges a lot of parents today. Because if we truly believe that, it's going to cramp up against what we sometimes want to do and want to believe. You might not like or you might disagree with what I'm about to say, but just because you disagree with it doesn't mean it's wrong, okay? So disagree if you want to, but let's really think about what this means. And by the way, sometimes it's healthy to disagree and, and think a little bit. So let me challenge you in a healthy way here to think about this. Well, my son's into baseball, so, you know, sometimes we're going to miss worship. Okay, I hear you. But did you just say that the greatest thing your child can do is serve God? Because it sounds like what you just said is the greatest thing your son can do is play ball. Look, baseball tournaments take you out of town. I get it. And baseball or fishing or scouts or schoolwork or fill in the blank with a hundred other things, something might take us out of town, but don't ever let anything take us out of worship. Worship never goes out of town. Listen, the greatest thing my child can do is serve God. So why would I settle for anything less than that? If it's truly the greatest thing, as parents, we need to make it the greatest priority. Hannah understood that the greatest thing her child could do was serve God. It was more important to her than Samuel grow up serving God than for her to grow up in her own house. Wow. As a godly parent, it is my job to be the biggest proponent of helping my children find ways to serve God. The greatest thing I can do for my child is serve God, and the greatest thing in the world that my child can do is serve God. Takeaway number three, the sacrificial heart of Hannah reminds me of the sacrificial heart of God. God's heart is touched by what he saw in Hannah's heart, probably because it was a whole lot like his heart. She loved her one and only son so much, but she was willing to give him up because it was the plan all along. God's example of love is even more powerful than that. Because God didn't just stop at the part where He allowed someone else to adopt His Son and raise Him. God gave up His Son to watch Him be killed. Wow. Why? Because it was the plan all along. Hannah was a different kind of person with a different kind of prayer. And that led to her becoming a different kind of parent. And as we close, I want to encourage you to be a different kind of person. When your enemy goes low, you go high. I want to encourage you to pray a different kind of prayer. Don't be afraid to ask God for big things, bold things. And lastly, parents, I want to encourage you to be a different kind of parent. Do whatever you can to encourage your your child to serve God, whatever the cost. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Hannah and her beautiful servant heart. 
Father, help us to be servants. Help us to encourage one another. As parents, help us to encourage our children to serve you. Help us to understand how important it is to fully surrender our hearts and our lives to you. Thank you for Hannah's beautiful example, her sacrificial love, a love that would stop at nothing from fulfilling what you would have her to do. Help us to have that kind of love too, that kind of love for our children and that kind of love for you. In Jesus' name, amen.